in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Robert was born in 1944 in Chicago, Illinois. His father was a police officer and his family faithfully attended their local Lutheran church. While attending Northwestern University, Robert met and then married his wife, Bonnie. Robert followed in his father's footsteps and became a police officer in Chicago. In 1981, Robert and his family moved to Washington, D.C., now with six children, and Robert joined the FBI. His family lived in one of the suburbs in, in Virginia where they attended their local church, the same church where I have friends who still attend to this day. Now, I can't tell you when Robert took his first misstep. I can't tell you the moment he began to surrender his integrity. But by the time he was arrested in 2001, Robert Hansen had been paid millions of dollars by the Russian government to sell state secrets and he had done untold damage to this country. Robert Hansen clearly set out with noble intentions to serve his community, to serve his country, to care for his family. But at some point, he began to be tempted and a battle waged within his own soul. I suspect that he made a little compromise at first, nothing too dramatic. But these little decisions can snowball into bigger decisions. And by the time Robert Hansen was arrested, he was leading a double life. He proclaimed one set of values, but lived by a completely different set. We often use the word integrity to mean honest or truthful or even good. But that doesn't really capture the meaning of this word. The word integrity finds its roots in the, in the Latin word integer, meaning whole or complete. We've even borrowed the word integer for our numeric system, where an integer is a whole number or a complete number, a number without any decimal places, a number that hasn't been divided. Integrity means living a life that is whole and completely consistent. Integrity means that we are dependable and reliable every day. Integrity means that our principles are always aligned with our actions. It's so easy for us to take those first little steps to compromise our values. It may not be selling national secrets, but in little ways, step by step, we surrender our integrity until we are also proclaiming one set of values and living by a completely different set. This is a challenging day, Palm Sunday. We begin with the joy of Jesus entering Jerusalem, and we end up in this silence as we remember Jesus dying on the cross. Palm Sunday can be so uncomfortable because we're forced to confront the inconsistency, the disconnect, the division between the people shouting hallelujah today and the same people just five days later calling for Jesus to be killed. 
When Jesus rode into, Jer into Jerusalem, the crowds were cheering and chanting, the bands were playing, there was great fanfare and adulation. For those of you who went on this walk through the district with us, following the donkey, that's what we remembered. But within a week, the same people are saying, crucify, let him be crucified. So what happened? What happened in those days? Some theologians have argued that the crowds wanted a king to rescue them and overthrow the Romans. And when they realized that Jesus wasn't going to do this, they turned on him. But I struggle to accept that this is really the explanation because Jesus had always peach, preached peace. He had always told us to love even our enemies. As Jesus rode into Jerusalem, he rode on a donkey, not the choice of a conquering hero. This explanation doesn't seem to make sense because Jesus never acted like a conquering king. However, the fact that we have tried to make this argument does indicate something significant. It shows that we are desperate to explain why the crowds change their tune so quickly. We are so desperate to explain away the crowd's reaction because we don't want to confront the fact that we may have these same inconsistencies in our own selves, these inconsistencies between who we aspire to be and who we're actually becoming day by day. On Sunday morning, we'll pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But then when someone cuts us off in traffic, we may be inclined to think or to shout, or even to gesture something less than gracious, something that is probably not God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven. Or we pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. But when someone actually hurts us or betrays us, our first response is often to think about revenge, not forgiveness. We think about how we can make sure that person never does that to me ever again. So here's my question. How often do the values we espouse misalign or disconnect from the actions we take? How often do we say one thing but act differently. When the Bible talks about the embodiment of evil, it occasionally speaks of the devil. The Greek word for devil is diabolos. This word shares its root with, with the word diabolin. Diabolin means to split, to split. The work of the evil one is to split, to divide, to drive a wedge. Adam and Eve were separated from God in the garden. Cain was divided from his brother Abel. Judas was split apart from the other disciples. And the work of the evil one today often includes creating divisions within our own souls driving a wedge between who we aspire to be and who we are actually becoming. We know one thing is right, but we do another. We teach our children one set of values, but we live by another. This is our last sermon in our series about sacred relationships, about the relationships we have where we're called to trust one another and be vulnerable with one another and be compassionate with one another and remember God's presence when we're in relationship with one another. But in order 
to have thriving relationships, we must have integrity. We must be whole people, undivided and unsplit. After all, people can't have a deep and a genuine relationship with you if every time they go to speak with you, they wonder what version of you they're going to encounter. Tom, the Christian, who's in church every Sunday, or Tom, the heartless businessman, who's always out to squeeze a dollar out of anyone he can find, or Tom, the man driven by his temper and prone to fits of rage. Thriving relationships require a foundation of integrity and consistency. Think about the crowds in Jerusalem, their inconsistency, their lack of integrity. When Jesus entered the city, they were shouting, Hosanna, but within a week they had changed their tune to crucify him, let him be crucified. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, they wanted to welcome the Messiah, but as the leaders in their community began to apply and exert social pressure, they were willing to throw Jesus to the cross. And I wonder how often we do this, how often we surrender to social pressure, how often do we believe something is morally right, but we instead choose the expedient option. A wedge is driven into our soul when we do this. We say one thing and we act differently. Living as Jesus calls us to live, living with integrity, will often require us to choose a more difficult path in the short term in order to be more consistent over the long term. We may have to turn down what seem to be attractive options because accepting them would compromise our values and our principles. And we'll certainly have to look to God for strength when the easy solution would be to take a simple compromise and when we're under this sort of pressure at, from family or from work or related to our finances, there's a temptation to just take a little bit of money from a Russian friend to just give up a few small secrets. But small compromises lead to bigger compromises and we increasingly can find that our lives are divided and we have surrendered our integrity. David Brooks, the author, wrote, if you live for external, it is easy to slip into a self-satisfied moral mediocrity. You grade yourself on a forgiving curve, but you live with an unconscious boredom separated from the deepest meaning of life and the highest moral joys. Gradually, a humiliating gap opens between your actual self and your desired self. This is a loss of integrity. This is a wedge being driven between your actual self and your desired self. And this was the decision tragically made by the crowds in Jerusalem. The Hebrew word shalom is often translated as peace, but its meaning is much broader. It means wholeness. It means completeness. In John's Gospel, Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Jesus was also saying, wholeness I leave with you, my completeness I give to you. Don't be divided. Don't be split. Be whole people. Be complete people. We're called to say what we believe and to do what we say and to be consistent in our behavior. And what this means 
from a Christian perspective, from those who follow Christ, is that our faith should drive our entire lives, our whole personhood. Our faith should guide us not only on Sunday morning when we're in church, but also Monday afternoon when we're making business decisions at work, and also Tuesday evening when we're with our family and maybe even facing disagreement. That is what the crowds in Jerusalem missed. They didn't have this consistency in their values and their decision making. So as we enter this Holy Week, I invite you to be consistent in hearing the message of Christ and following it each day. Consider Monday Thursday's call I give you a new commandment to love one another as I have loved you. Or Good Friday's message, the power of Jesus' love and sacrifice. Or Easter's assurance, God's love is stronger than the powers of darkness or sin or even death. And if you want to live in a relationship with God, a thriving relationship, take this Holy Week as an invitation to begin living with consistency, with integrity, as complete people, as whole people. Amen.